Okay, guys, I apologize for not being here today. Um, what I wanted to do is leave you with a short little video to review procedures for doing inference with the chi-square tests. And the two in particular would be the chi-square goodness of fit test and then the chi-square test for independence. For those of you that were absent last class, I kind of made um, a list of different things that I want to do for the next few days just to get you guys through the rest of the marking period and to give you opportunities to bring up your grade. And so each day what I'm going to do is offer just a little bit of a review of one particular inference um, procedure and then give you a short assessment that follows. And it'll be just like what I went over. You may use your notes. You may even use a partner. The goal is that you will have, I'll get the grades I need in my grade book and you'll also do well and pull up your averages. I know the past couple of weeks have been very stressful with all your AP exams. I know you guys have fallen behind and you're stressed out and you're ready to get out of here. So I know that you would probably rather kick your feet back and relax for the next couple of days, but I am looking out for you. Um, I just need you to hang on for a couple more days, get some of this work done, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that you guys can pull up your averages. So today I'm going to focus specifically on chi-squared, and I'm going to go over the two types of tests that I'm going to quiz you on in about 15 minutes. Um, the first is the chi-squared test for goodness of fit. And so um, you should have the review guide, um, and it's just the two problems. So in the first problem, we have a situation that says, in a recent year at the 6 p.m. time slot, television channels 2, 3, 4, and 5 captured the entire audience with 30%, 25%, 20%, and 25% respectively. During the first week of the next season, 500 viewers are interviewed. Suppose that the observed numbers of the viewers are as follows. And so you're given a table of the observed values. So this, these are your sample statistics. Okay, that's what the observed values are. And then in part A, it says a network executive believes that his network's new lineup, the viewing, that with his network's new lineup, I'm sorry, the viewing preferences are going to be different in this next season. He intends to conduct a significance test, state the hypotheses, and verify the conditions for inference are met. So with the chi-square test, remember, we're not using mean or proportion because we're dealing with the counts of categorical variables. So we're looking at the distribution of viewers on these particular channels. And if we're looking at whether or not the viewing um, distribution has changed, our null hypothesis is going to be to assume that it has not. So we have to write the null hypothesis out in words. And so that would be that the, um, that the distribution of viewer preferences has not changed um, from one season to the next. Okay. The alternative would be what the net network executive su suspects, and that is the viewing preferences have changed. So that's our alternative hypothesis. And I'm just going to abbreviate this. Viewing preferences have changed. Okay. We also have to verify that the conditions for inference are met. And with the chi-squared, it's a little bit different. We still need to have the assumption of a simple random sample, which it doesn't specifically state in the problem. It just says that during the first week of the next season, 500 um, viewers are interviewed. So we're going to have to assume a simple random sample and independence. The next condition is that our expected numbers, our expected values, are supposed to be more than 5. If any of them are less than 5, then it's supposed to be a no more than 20%. So it, as, as long as at least 20% of our cells have more than 5 um, counts in them, then we're good to go. So I have to figure out the expected number. So I know that we surveyed 500 viewers, and I know that we expect 30% of them to watch channel 2. And 30% of 500 is going to be 150. So I expect 150 of my viewers out of the sample to be watching channel 2. 25% of the 500 should be watching channel 3. And 25% of 500 is 125. 20% should be watching channel 4. That's 100. And then again, 25% are watching channel 5. And that's 125. Okay, and so now I have my expected counts. I can see that all of those counts are greater than 5. 
And so that condition is also met. So the last step then is to calculate chi-squared and find the p-value and then determine whether or not I have a significant um, result and whether or not I can reject the null hypothesis. Now my virtual calculator that I have is the old kind. So unfortunately this calculator does not enable me to do a goodness of fit test, but it's easy enough to come up with the value of chi-squared. Um, and in this case, anytime you have your data in a list, and that's where I'm going to put it. I think it's already entered in here for me. Oh, nope, it's not. So anytime you have your data in a list, um, you know that you can use a goodness of fit test. So if I enter in my data, my um, observed is 139, 138, 112, and 111. And then my expected is 150, 125, 100, and 125. Now since my calculator doesn't actually do the goodness of fit test, I'm going to have to figure out chi-squared by hand. If you have one of the newer calculators though, you can just go into your test menu and choose the goodness of fit test, and obviously mine's not going to show up, um, but if you choose the goodness of fit test, then you can select the two lists that you're using and also determine the degrees of freedom. And remember that if you're dealing with the chi-squared goodness of fit, it's always the number of categories minus one. So degrees of freedom is your number of categories minus one. And so in this case, it's going to be four minus one or three. So if you can do the test on your calculator, you're good to go. I'm going to go ahead and just go through the process of um, doing it using my lists. So I have my observed values in list one, I have my expected values in list two, two and on the top of the worksheet, whoops, where is it? Oh, I didn't put it in here, did I? Um, on the top of the worksheet you have um, how to calculate the chi-squared value, which is basically taking the sum of your observed minus your expected values, squaring it, and dividing by the expected. So in my list, all I'm going to do in list three is in parentheses, I'm going to do my observed, which are in list one, minus my expected, which are in list two. I am going to square those values, and then I'm going to divide by the expected values, which again are in list two. And that's going to give me all the little numbers that I'm going to add up to get chi-squared. If I go to my home screen, I can do second list, oops, and then take the sum, which is option five, and I'm going to take the sum of list three, and I get my chi-squared value is 5.17. And so now when I write this down, give myself a little bit more space. I'm now finding the probability that chi-squared is greater than 5.17. Now if you did the goodness of fit test on your calculator, it's going to tell you chi-squared, it's going to tell you the p-value, and you're good to go. Since I don't have that option, I'm going to have to calculate the p-value all by myself. So I'm going to go to my second distribution menu, and I'm going to calculate, because it's an inequality, I'm going to choose the CDF, and my lower bound is 5.17, my upper bound is 9999999 and I need to enter in my degrees of freedom which we said were 3. And my p value is 0.1597 or essentially 0.16. Okay. And so then we want to state our conclusions. And I'll actually I'm going to put the degrees of freedom down here since that's really where it really belongs. Okay. So I've stated my probability obviously since p is greater than 0.05, the result is not significant. That means we can't reject the null hypothesis. And I'm just going to abbreviate. And basically what that means is this executive who thinks that the distribution of viewers has changed, he can't draw that conclusion because the probability is too high. So we basically say we cannot conclude that the distribution of viewers has changed. Okay, and that is the chi-square test for goodness of fit. Let's take a look at the next problem. 
The next problem is a little bit different because you're given a two-way table. And there's actually two scenarios that we could have. We could have a two-way table where we're actually looking at two different groups and two different variables. Um, or we could have a two-way table where it's actually just one group and the group is being measured using two different variables. So either way, we have two variables. Um, whether it's one group or two group will determine whether or not you're doing a test for homogene homogeneity or a test for independence. If it's two groups, then it's a test for homogeneity. If it's one group just identified using two variables, then it's a test for independence. Regardless, you're using the exact same step, so it's, it's not a huge deal. Um, in this example, it says in a nationwide telephone poll of 1,000 adults representing Democrats, Republicans, and independents, respondents were asked if their confidence in the U.S. banking system had been shaken by the savings and loan crisis. The answers cross-classified by party affiliation are given in the table below. So if the null hypothesis is that the shaken confidence in the banking system is independent of party affiliation, so you're actually told in this case, so we're saying um, party affiliation, there's no relationship. And um, confidence in banking is independent. And we're basically saying not related here. Our alternative then would be that there is a relationship. between banking and party affiliation. I'm not going to spend the time writing it all down. So this time we're doing a test for um, independence. And because it's a two-way table, I can no longer use my list. Instead, we use the, um, the matrix. And if you remember, when you're entering a matrix into your calculator, um, matrix is above the X inverse button, so you have to hit the second button first. And then you have to actually scroll over to edit and then choose the matrix that you want to enter. And so I've got this information already in here. Remember, this is um, we have three rows and three columns, and so this is a three by three matrix. The number of rows comes first. You're going to enter the data. These are your the, your actual values, what you observed. And if you want to pause this so you can enter those values, and you can. I'm going to go ahead. Um, the next thing we need to do is come up with the expected values, the expected matrix. And the only way to do that is to find the sum of all of these columns and rows um, and then use those numbers to determine what we would expect. So of all the yeses, there were 400. I'm just going to save you the time. Of all the noes, there were 490. Of all the no opinions, there were 110. Of all the Democrats, there were 450. Of Republicans, there were 350. And of independence, there were 200. And altogether, we know there were 1,000 people who responded to this survey. So in order for me to continue, I have to make some assumptions. First of all, it doesn't say that this was a simple random sample. It just says that it was a, a phone poll. So we're going to have to make the assumption that we're dealing with a simple random sample and independence. The next thing we need to do is figure out what the expected values are and then make sure that they're all over 5. And if you remember, to calculate each of the expected outcomes, or, um, we're going to multiply the row total times the column total and divide by the table total. And so again, we're gonna, you can actually do these calculations right in the matrix. So if I hit second matrix again, oops, second matrix, um, and scoot over to edit, now I want to work in matrix B. Now, I've already got these values in here, but I'm going to tell you how I calculated them. And you can actually do the multiplication right in the matrix. So, for example, if I go down to um, that first cell, the first row and the first column, that's essentially telling me I need to multiply my first row total, which is 450. And so, let's say I ended up with 180. So, it's basically taking 450 times the column total, which is 400, divided by the table total, which is 1,000. And so that's where the 180 came from. And so you're going to do that for each of the values in this matrix, the row total times the column total divided by the table total. And you can see from my matrix that none of those values are less than 5. So that's the other condition that has to be met. Now, if one of them was less than 5, that would be OK. None of them are allowed to be 0. Once you've entered them all in, I can go ahead and do my test. And again, I'm going to go to my uh, stat, 
this time I can go over to tests and with the old calculators it's the only chi-squared option for everybody else you're just going to choose the chi-squared test and it's pretty much set up for you you need to pick the matrix that your observed values are in which is matrix A you need to pick the matrix where your expected values are in and that's in matrix B the calculator pretty much does the rest the chi-squared value is 3.024 and remember with chi-squared it's always greater than Our p-value is 0.554. And our degrees of freedom, if you remember, with a two-way table, it's always the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. So that would leave us with four degrees of freedom. But your calculator will also tell you that. And finally, um, we want to state our conclusion. I'm not going to write this out. I'll just say it out loud because I think you guys um, probably can do this at this point. Um, obviously, the fact that our probability is 55%, this um, result is not very unusual. It's going to happen more than half the time. So because my result is not significant, I can't reject the null hypothesis, I'm not allowed to conclude that there's a relationship between party affiliation and um, the confidence in the banking system and so you'd want to write that out so just remember that anytime you're asked to state your conclusion you want to tell me three things whether or not it's significant whether or not you can reject the null hypothesis and then write a sentence that explains what what that all means with respect to the problem um, so hopefully this clarifies any misconceptions you might have had um, the quiz will probably take about 20 minutes, not very long. I would like you to use your notes, work together with a partner, and if you are finished, if you were absent last class, there is a video posted on Blackboard. I'm actually going to post this video on Blackboard as well for anybody who's out um, that refers to the inference for means. I would like you to go ahead and watch that video now. Headphones are in the drawers. Um, so please just download the video and watch it. It takes about, I think it's another 15 or maybe 20 minutes, I'm not sure. For those of you that were in class last time, you've already taken the quiz on inference of, for means. Um, I do have an AP drill that I would like you to take. Um, and I suppose I will leave that out for you if you'd like to go ahead and work on that. Um, and then for those of you, after you finish the video, why don't you go ahead and work on the AP drill as well. If you don't finish, just leave it here and we'll work on it next class. We only have, I think, two classes left. Um, we'll meet once, I think, during the week of um, HSAs, and then I think we'll meet one more time for those of you that are taking the senior final. So um, next class, we're going to do linear regression, inference for linear regression, and you'll have the opportunity to take another quiz then. I will be available on Friday during Bulldog Block if you have some catching up to do. Um, and then for those of you that are not taking the senior final, if there's anything else that you need to do, obviously you can use the class period to make up any missed work. Um, for those of you that are taking the senior final, it's just going to be on these tests. So everything that we've been reviewing, the two videos that I've posted, watch them, make sure you understand how to do the um, inference procedures, and that is what your final will be on. Good luck, and I will see you next week.